Today, I'm going to be talking about some autonomous NASA robots and sort of the records that they're breaking on Mars and kind of a little bit about why we care about that. First, I thought I'd start with telling you about those of you who sort of, many of you work with JPL, a little bit about the JPL organizational structure because it sort of has an impact on what I'll be talking about. So the banner on the top, it's showing artist concepts of what the robotics organization does. So robotics is kind of like a department, sort of mechanical engineering or computer science, and we call that the line organization. And so the people who work in that would work on robotics concepts from like really early stage ideas and research to actually prototyping, building the systems, iterating on them, and then building the hardware, writing the software, actually testing it, and then launching it and uh, running it on Mars. So those are sort of the things that people in that organization would do. And at the bottom, the banner, I'm showing an example of a project, which is an example is the Mars 2020 project, which is, uh, for example, the Ingenuity helicopter and the Perseverance rover. So on the projects, you're dealing with all the aspects for one mission. So from launch to landing, entry, descent, landing, parachutes, crews, and the robotics is part of it, and there's science and instruments, but it's one aspect of a bigger mission. So we work between these, and I have roles in both of these organizations. And you know, there are other examples of projects we've had where robotics overlaps with the flight projects, and other examples are like the Sojourner rover, uh, MER rovers, uh, the Curiosity rover, uh, Perseverance, and uh, we've had some landed missions, and the Ingenuity helicopter. So essentially, robotics is an aspect of some of these missions. And today, um, I was going to talk less. I think I've talked to some of you in individual meetings more about some of the other projects we have, like Cadre and EELS. But today, I was going to focus more on the Mars 2020 robotic aspects only. I'm happy to talk about others as, as I chat with uh, more of you. And the parts about that that the robotics really deals with is the mobility and navigation. So everything to do with getting the rovers from place to place and the helicopter and the robotic arm. So we have a 2.1 meter arm, which has a turret at the end of it, which is how we position it close to the surface and drill the surface or braid and position instruments. And then also a sampling system, which is primarily the reason that this mission was sent to Mars. So you, it ha the external arm collects and drills cores, but it docks with the body of the rover, inside which there is a second robotics system. And there's a second robotic arm. So the external arm transfers the tubes in which we've collected the samples to the internal system. And then that goes and measures them and seals them and uh, sort of deploys them later on to the surface or transfers them to the next lander, uh, which is the primary part of the mission. And then there's also the Ingenuity helicopter. And that is a new part of this mission. So this is essentially a completely separate robotic entity that we also have as part of the mission. Uh, the other um, part that today I was going to focus on is Perseverance is kind of this mission's been fairly successful so far. So already we've collected 21 samples. It can collect a total of 43. And the sample collection rate has been about going to unique sites at twice the rate of any other mission that we had done before. So it's been really quite productive. And then it's driven 17 uh, kilometers. And what's really exciting is just how far we are able to go in a SOL. So it's, it set the record for the longest drive in a single SOL, which is 319 meters. But what's kind of interesting about it is before this, the rover that held the record was the Opportunity rover, which was in 2005. So a really long time ago. That's like 17 years ago. And there was a lot of things that had to come together for Opportunity to set that record. And for a long time, you know, Curiosity never broke that record. And now with Perseverance, we've exceeded that like over 20 times. So what's, what's really exciting is we're getting to the stage where it isn't just one off that we can drive hundreds of kilometers, uh, hundreds of meters, kilometers would be great, but it's uh, starting to get pretty consistent. And that's actually the part that's really exciting. And then we're also able to do multiple soil drives. So now we, we communicate with Earth, and I'll go into it a little bit, on an infrequent basis, but we can command it without 
uh, Earth contact back to back so we can drive over multiple days. And we've gone about 700 meters. And most of this has actually been autonomous driving. And it's about 88% of the driving, and it varies. You know, It's probably a slightly different number today. But on prior missions, it was just 7%. So this is an order of magnitude more driving is actually autonomous driving. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Ingenuity, the helicopter. And now we are up to 47 flights that we've done with Ingenuity. And uh, that's really exciting, because before this, we didn't even know if we could fly rotorcraft on Mars. And now we've covered quite a lot of distance uh, with, with the rotorcraft. So I'll go a little bit into, you know, in general, the fact that we're doing this, the robotics is interesting. But what drives all of our missions is the science behind it. And so how is that, um, how is that being impacted? It's trying to get me to join the network. <laughs> but uh, so this image here is of Jezero Crater. So when Perseverance was going to land, the scientists really wanted to go to this location because we're looking for signs of ancient life. And the delta is a really likely place that you're going to find that. The problem is that the landing ellipse needed to be pretty small in order for us to land there. And in this image, and it might be a little bit small, on the left side, I'm showing there the landing ellipses. And you can just see the ovals get a sense what they were for Sojourner and Curiosity and Murr. They were really massive. And if we had tried to land in, in uh, Jezero, we, we, we would have been well outside of the entire crater. The reason we could do this is even though this crater has walls that are fairly tall, tens of meters. And if you land on the edge of a wall, it's hazard. We had capability on board that would allow us to track. So we had a prior map on board. And then as the lander is coming in, it's taking images and comparing and detecting where we're actually headed. And as you'll see, these are landmarks being detected. We were actually headed toward a hazardous area. And it's able to, in this. Uh, uh, detect that and converge on a solution, detect that, and it commanded a divert. So as the spacecraft is coming down, uh, it was determined that we were going to head towards it. And so we ended up diverting to the other side of the delta. Now, this was great because uh, the spacecraft is safe and we were able to land. But at the same time, uh, this meant that uh, we were now uh, on the other side of the delta from this hazard zone and we were going to need to get around it. So in this image here, I'm kind of showing the three campaigns which help define the science part of the mission. So the yellow part, the yellow oval, is where we landed on Sol Zero. And in the beginning, we, the science mission was interested in now that we're on the crater floor, let's go investigate and go see what we can opportunistically find here. And then the next destination was really to get to the blue area, which is the delta, which is why we'd come to Mars. And once we had finished the uh, yellow area crater flow campaign, we just really wanted to go as quickly as possible to the other destination. And as you can see from this image, I'm showing the example. That's, it's a little bit small, but the dots, the little crosses, are showing all the areas we sampled and all the areas that we've done science observations that the science is really interested in. And they were mainly in the crater floor at the bottom there and in the delta. And there wasn't a lot of interesting features in the rapid traverse area getting from one point to the other. And every white dot is a location the rover has been at. So very quickly, once we were done, we started driving all the way around. And this is where the robotics really becomes very valuable is you're not stuck to one landing location. At the same time, you want to go as fast as possible. And the spacing between those dots get larger, showing we did about 95% of that drive autonomously. And for planetary robotics, it was a big deal. We were able to cover the five kilometers in less than a month. And so you know, this is an area where the scientists really started to build a trust because this was exceeded their expectations. They didn't quite expect us to get there this fast. And the reason this is a bit challenging is uh, most of you probably know, but I still find that you know, it's very different from terrestrial applications, is we only get to talk to the rover about once a day. So we send commands and send the instructions for the entire SOL through the deep space networks direct to the rover. And then it'll collect information and data and transmit it, it to orbiters and sends it back to us. Because we are only sending instructions once a day, it large, and there's no communication to see how monitoring of how that drive is going or how any of the sample collection is going. 
it needs to be largely autonomous. And that's really what is, is the big reason we're able to drive these long distances and break these records is primarily because we've been able to drive most of this autonomously. In this graph, along the x-axis, you're seeing the salts, the number of uh, salts um, as the rover has progressed. And on the y-axis is the cumulative drive distance. And the different colors are showing the modes. So we tend to have humans direct from Earth sometimes when we're doing precision drives. They're still really good at that part. But once you're going over the horizons, human can't, humans can't see. And so orange is the autonomous driving. And there, there are gradations of that where there is some moderate amount of supervision when we're doing visual odometry or a guarded mode. But this, uh, the area in the middle, that I'm, the column that I'm showing, is the rapid traverse. And you can see we were doing an exploratory forays in the beginning. And then in the rapid traverse, we really just drove and picked up a lot of the autonomous navigation pace and then continued on to continue to drive autonomously. So how is it, you know, we've been driving for so long on these, uh, with Mars rovers, why is it that we were able to make such a leap? And partly, even more, we were given the problem that Perseverance had to be what NASA likes to call a built-to-print rover. So essentially, not a lot of the infrastructure was going to change the hardware. But yet, we needed to draw, wanted to drive a lot faster. So how do you take the same motor control system, the same processor, it's just a 133 megahertz processor, and try to add a lot of that speed? So some of this was us you know, improving the algorithms, but really, We've done that before, and what really made the difference was thinking about it as to where the real bottlenecks were and really strategically targeting those. So here are some of the examples. Um, the first was the wheels. So we'd, we'd been on Mars for decades, and we have scientists who sort of specialize in that terrain, and yet none of them predicted that we'd have these tiny, tiny rocks in uh, when we were in Gale Crater with Curiosity that are geometrically not at all a hazard for the rover but they are sharp, and they're, they're volcanic in origin, and they're called ventifacts. And they started tearing up the Curiosity wheels, and we started to get a lot of holes. And now it became interesting, because you're like, you need to avoid these tiny obstacles, and the autonomous navigation wasn't really set up to do that, because those are not obstacles as far as the autonomy was concerned. And we had similar problems on Mur, where one of the wheels got stuck on uh, Spirit, and Opportunity's wheel was towed in. Making your autonomous algorithm now completely change the model uh, takes some time. And so in these missions, we started to use less autonomy because the autonomy wasn't actually driving the vehicle in the ways we wanted. So we could have solved the problem by making it more adaptable. Instead, you know, here we took a simpler approach, which is to say, just make the wheels more robust so we don't have to worry about this stuff and we could just drive over this. So this is an approach where you're like, instead of solving it, by trying to algorithmically coming up with a more complex solution, uh, we came up with a solution where we actually 3D printed um, over 50 wheels because it's really expensive to build a single meal. They're machined out of a single solid piece of metal. And we drove them for kilometers in the Mars yard in different designs and eventually settled on this design, which has a little bit of a sinusoidal curve on the wheels and slightly thicker wheels and has you know, slight other design changes. And they've been doing really well and allow us to not worry about the small stuff, essentially. In the middle is like the changes we made to the navigation cameras. So really improve the resolution and also uh, the exposure and speed. So now you don't have to worry about slewing the mast and trying to be clever about how you image to fill in the gaps. The cameras can handle all of that with single images. So this was another way where we really improve the fidelity of the maps. And then the last one, which actually tends to be the most important, is the computing. Uh, the computer, we were kind of needed, because this is a, what NASA calls a Class B mission, which has a certain risk tolerance, we just needed to have radiation-hardened computers, and we were limited to this really slow computer. So instead, we put a second one. We put a dedicated computer just for the mobility system, and we did all the stereo and computer vision processing in an FPGA. So it was you know, hard-coded, but it allowed us to get a lot of uh, speed in that way. Well, relatively most speed. Uh, so with these solutions, we also obviously needed to still improve the algorithm. And so there's a lot of improvements in the path planning and prediction of slope. So in terrestrial applications, we don't worry about that a lot. But in Mar Mars, generally all vehicles that are surface vehicles, slip is a huge factor. And how well you can predict it so you can still be turning your wheels and have an accurate estimate of where it'll end up is very helpful. 
And then there are other things. In the middle, I'm showing an actual drive where autonomous navigation is diverting. And one of the challenges used to be people want to know where it ends up because I need to communicate with Earth. And I need to know that it's a pointing where it's RTG or any other part of the rover's body is not going to occlude that view to Earth. Uh, so well, we came up with autonomous turn for calm, where as the rover is driving, it knows where Earth is, and it'll turn to Earth. And if it can't turn to Earth at the location in which it is, it'll continue to drive until it can find a spot at which it can turn or uh, you know, terminate and, uh, without doing that endlessly. Uh, another thing that is, is sort of like gyro's drift. So we would start to accrue uncertainty, and we had to cap how far that could go. Because those bounds, based on that, we made assumptions about hazards that we'd specified to the rover, and also communications. If your attitude uh, deviates too much, you, again, can't communicate. So we have this approach where if, it's, if it drifts too much, it'll stop, it'll find the sun, and correct its attitude, and then continue driving. So it uses sun finding as a way, mid-drive, to get more accurate estimates. So these are some of the approaches that are not directly tied to what we might classically think of as you know, improved navigation, but have really made a lot of the difference. And then there still are things you can't do with, um, with the navigation yet. It's not that we can't do them. It's just we are constrained by schedule. Your mission is going to launch. You have to test and verify. And one of them ends up being that um, we do very well with geometric obstacles, which is you know rocks, craters, edges of uh, you know cliffs. But texture is still sort of uh, challenging for vision-based approaches. And so instead of trying to solve all of that problem, what we do here is this is actually a drive from Mars. This is what we use to drive the rover. This is the exact tool we use. We have a menu of options where we, uh, we, we create these geometric patterns when the middle, the cyan, and the, yell, uh, the magenta are the path. So a human operator will suggest a path. That's not the one that it's actually going to follow if there's an obstacle. It'll deviate from it. But it doesn't have to solve the problem from first principles. Also, we keep these uh, uh, rectangles. You see the green as keep in areas, and the reds are don't bother to figure it out. I don't want you to hunt and peck because it's seen locally. To find a way around it, I know it's not going worth going into that area from orbital maps on the ground. So we have these suggestions that we can provide it, but the uncertainty grows as it's moving. So we also have on the, on the bottom right showing a model where the geometric regions we tell it to keep out of will grow. So it factors in the uncertainty. So we don't have to worry about in creating them at certain size, which we used to, and factor in, oh, by the time the rover gets here, uh, its pose will have drifted. So I need to make this fake obstacle much larger. And so it's able, to, using this, we solve the problem of not having to make the algorithm figure it out. Humans could do it from Earth, and it didn't have to be precise. The rover on board can still manage that. And so these are the approaches that have like really helped us um, get some, solve some of these challenges and drive further distances. Um, this is a plot up to 562 sols, about a year and a half into the mission, of all of the commands we have sent for robotics. This is another approach we use where we actually send moderate level granularity commands. So we may still send a waypoint goal and have various knobs that we can turn that we control from Earth. These are automatically generated. So the actual commanding is happening through a very high level visual interface, and it auto generates the low level commands, but we can reconfigure them. So here, this column is showing uh, in purple all the commands for mobility. So we're only driving. And the green is flying. So we're only driving and flying. And we fly the helicopter and drive at the same time on the same salt. And this one on the left in the yellow is the time when we were in the crater floor. And we would, we've kind of in an exploratory phase where you can see we drive in purple some. And then these spikes are samples where we collected a sample, found it interesting, went to a different location. So this is a very exploratory phase. And this is what we want, is doing more science on either end. And the driving is just a very small duration where we're essentially transporting from one place to the other. And in the delta, it's a slightly different uh, region on the right where we knew that we wanted a sample. This is where we came for. And you can see that we have a very targeted sampling with some finding the location that we want to sample at it. But we actually um, have control over a lot of uh, the types of commands we may generate uh, in order to accomplish this. And this is something we're interested in 
automatically exploring. Is we, this is still done with humans creating that translation between the higher level to the lower level. And so, you know, we were talking about things like language models and others. There's a lot of potential here for making this more automated and actually consistent between different operators. Um, and then this is, um, a, these are images of, on the left of an autonomous drive, and those are the actual images that the rover uses to navigate. And this is SOL 210. Uh, this is sort of you're seeing the picture, but what it doesn't show is just there's actually a lot of occlusions and holes in these images that it has to work with in order to navigate. We rarely get down every frame. We actually spend most of our bandwidth to get down science data. So this is one of the, you know, there are few drives where we have all of the data. Otherwise, we take a sampling for engineering purposes, but otherwise mostly, um, uh, and it is sped up. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, and so essentially this is about, I, I would say, uh, we took an image every 30 seconds, and so we've strung it together in real time. So it's about probably 200 times sped up. So this is, again, another real drive that we did on Mars. This is around the south, you know, we were seeing the South Seta region, where it was a weekend, and we were doing a long drive where you can see humans have suggested the path and areas to keep out of. But for three days in a row, the uh, autonomous navigation was following this path. And you can see it's deviating. It found a little obstacle that we had not specified from the ground, and it's working its way around it and is able to find a path. And this uh, resulted in driving over 500 meters. Uh, over the weekend with, without actually any intervening um, communication with Earth. Then this is another example of the sorts of drives where I was saying we drove 700 meters, where sometimes we are not going to have any communication but to get data down from Mars, but we can send it new instructions. We, so we're transmitting in the blind. We don't actually know where the previous drive will end up because it's going to be autonomous and we can string together the drives. We don't do this very frequently because we might as well have done it on the first day we planned and just send the plan for many days in a row. But the resource modeling can sometimes get quite challenging. And it takes, you want to have people on Earth have a normal work day uh, and not be working you know, 18 hours. So we might have them come on multiple days, even though they're actually sending the plan up in chunks and we're not actually, we actually don't know where anything has ended up. We can model the uncertainty. So this is a case where on the left, you're seeing the drive where the bigger circles show the uncertainty growth, and we're just stringing them. And what actually happened on Mars is different from what we simulated, but within those bounds. And with this, we can just say drive until the time, a certain time at which the orbiter is going to pass, and it continues to drive. And this has worked really well. Um, uh, to allow us to drive really long distances and also allow people, sort of now people are becoming the case where you're suggesting new input, you're not kind of controlling it in a serial manner. And as we get to the outer planets, that's going to be more and more the case. Because when we get to places like Europa and Enceladus, you're going to only communicate once every week or less, and for very short durations. Uh, this here, in the same path, while we were driving, Ingenuity, the helicopter, it can only talk to Earth via the rover because it doesn't have the power for direct Earth communication. So one of the other challenges we have is we have to always maintain line of sight between the helicopter and the rover. So we landed in this area where uh, you know, the first flight occurred, which was the first time we could demonstrate whether we could even fly. And one of the challenges with Ingenuity was just, can it survive the Martian night? It's a 1.8 kilogram vehicle, and uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, heating and other capability. And so as we started to realize it was going to be able to continue flying, we've had it follow the uh, rover. And in the south, you could see it did some scouting flights. And then when we were going to drive around, even though it can fly 700 meters, 704 meters has been a long flight in 90 seconds, so it's a lot faster than the rover, but it needs to charge. And there's a lot of things that have to occur. So actually, the rover at the moment ends up being faster in getting around to places than the helicopter. So when we were going to go all the way around, uh, Ingenuity might not have been able to keep up. So it was clear we were going to have to take a shortcut for Ingenuity, and that's what we did, is fly across. But it becomes an interesting robotics problem because you have to ensure that every point, with uncertainty, because you're going to fly and drive, either can fail, that it can always communicate. So we have these maps, which you're seeing in the inside on the left, where we do these telecommunications link strength. 
so you know where the regions are, where it's going to be able to communicate. At the moment, this is done on the ground. This is another thing we would like to do on board so that you can eventually, because if you're going to have these vehicles communicate and keep track of uh, you know, doing scouting, we're going to need to do more of this on board. Um, and so what got interesting was Ingenuity did make it to the Delta, as did Perseverance. But when we got there, uh, it was starting to be the Martian winter. So the Mars year is about twice as long because Mars is further from the sun and takes it uh, two, year, two Earth years to get around the sun. Well, it was winter now, and we knew we were going to have some trouble with Ingenuity because it's such a small spacecraft. And in the bottom here, I'm showing the graph where in red is our predictions for how its um, charge was going to evolve. And uh, on the x-axis is Elsabas. So Elsabas is, you know, the song, solar uh, longitude. And it's essentially, tra it, 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 you can think of it as the seasons on Mars. And so we knew that as winter and fall came, it was going to dip. But it actually got to be a lot worse than we expected it to be. So on Sol for um, 26, we would started a lot, you know, you want the avionics on a spacecraft to not get too low, because generally it's the avionics, if they freeze, you don't know if they're going to recover from that, because the Mars uh, temperature is really low. We started lowering the set point. So it used to be, uh, you know, minus 15, made it minus 20, minus 25. It was still not enough. And so essentially, uh, you know, we lost contact, and uh, Ingenuity kind of entered a load shed, low power mode. And at that point, it's lost track of its clock. It doesn't know what time it is. So when it wakes up, we have a particular time at which we would know. We would have set the alarm to say, this is the time which the rover is going to contact you, and you sort of hail the vehicle. Well, it was not going to know what time it is. So we would wake up the rover, and we just started hunting. So when Ingenuity is going to wake up so that you can track and communicate with it. Well, it didn't wake up right away. And essentially, it would wake up just enough and get enough power, uh, and then it would freeze again. And so it was essentially going through these cycles. But eventually, we, we, did, we call this capture now. So we actually still fly it this way. So in the, it, it sort of has amnesia, loses track of its time every night. And in the morning, we have now quite precisely figured out when it's going to wake up. You have a good model of it. So we about spend an hour doing what we call a capture. So we capture it to say, this is the time, and then we set its clock to when we want to fly. Because flying on Mars, you want to do it particular times, because that's when uh, the density is the right and the wind speeds are correct. So then the sec we've set its clock, and then we'll fly. Next time or a sol again, we will capture it again, and then we'll fly it. So that's kind of how we're doing it until things get better. So uh, you, know, you can see the flights here got a lot smaller. And I'm showing you flight 2930. We were starting to do very small hops. Mostly, you know, we were lucky because Perseverance was in the Delta and mostly doing sampling there, so it wasn't very far away. But Ingenuity was able to sort of recover and uh, uh, get, uh, get more energy. And we are entering into better season through about until September was like really challenging. But we're finding that it's actually accumulated more dust on its solar panel. Originally, every time it would fly, the dust would kind of blow off. But now, the latest images, which I'll show you a video we took just this week, um, it's starting to accumulate more dust. And that means less charge. Uh, and so you know, while it was doing this, we really went to Mars. The biggest thing that Perseverance is doing is collecting intact sample cores. Because we're, we, we're looking for signs of life. And Earth laboratory, we've, we've gotten laboratories we've sent to Mars and done analysis. But really, Earth has like so much more. Uh, ways to analyze this. So this is the time we want to collect and bring them back. So this is an example of a rock where we, uh, where I show where we've drilled it. And on the right, you're seeing a cross section. We do take some video images on Earth, but it's much easier in the test bed to see. So this is an example where, I sh uh, where I'm showing in one of our chambers. We try to create the right pressure and temperature, where this is a tube we picked up from inside the rover. Uh, from, with the second robotic arm inside, passing it onto it. We have this bit carousel, which rotates. We have multiple bits that we can switch for coring and abrading. And it moves it out. There's uncertainty with respect to where the ground is. So we have a, something called an FCS, a facility contact. So to remove the uncertainty, mechanically, we touch the surface. 
We know exactly where it is in the Z, in the tool frame, even if we don't, we have some lateral error, which we actually remove with vision-based closed loop um, uh, accuracy adjustment. Then we can, our relative accuracy is pretty good. So when we switch from one tool to the other, we, have, we reasonably accurately know where the surface is. Because the science team will, when they're really interested, they're like, I want to go to this vein. I want to go to a feature that is two millimeters. You're t dealing with a 100 kilogram arm with all of its um, uh, uncertainties. And then we uh, drill into the surface. This has been quite interesting, and I'll show you some results. Uh, and uh, we are trying to collect intact cores. You can see the tailings start to come about. And this is another thing that we have to model for subsequent placements. Because we put instruments that have very delicate lenses later on to study features, and you want to make sure they don't um, uh, sort of hit the tailings. We uh, you know, can uh, get the arm back in position. We take the images you're seeing of the cross sections, we take by rotating the arm and actually just positioning the arm and looking at it and in different positions. And then after that, we uh, sort of go back to the bit carousel and on the rover's body and we dock with it. We have some cones that can be used to uh, guide the positioning. And then we transfer the tube inside. I'm not showing the video of what happens inside, but there's a second robotic arm that pulls it, it weighs it, images it, and then seals it. These seals need to be pretty good because they've got to survive up to 10 years on the surface of Mars potentially, and then Earth re-entry when they're going to come back. Um, so that's kind of you know the coring operation. And in this graph, which is again uh, um, maybe a little small, but you can see along the x-axis are all the salts. These are some of the cores we've taken, and on the y, uh, there are three different you know, plots. So we have the commanded depth that we want to go. Typically, we, you know, these are about the size of a chalk, the cores. But, and then what actually occurs, because the rock can be very hard or it can be very soft. So we actually use adaptive drilling because we don't want to wait and figure out what it is and then command the next day with adjusted parameters. We do it closed loop. Well, if you might have noticed, you know, the green is the actual length we achieved as we measured it in image. The first one, there's no green because we got no sample. <laughs> so after all the testing, we have like the world specialist and all the rocks and we drilled all the variety of rocks they'd given us, probably 40 or 50. The very first sample that we drilled, it completely pulverized. And we looked at the sample and it was empty. So the way that the uh, composition of the rock was, it literally crumbled with the drilling and resulted in all tailings. We adjusted it and subsequently we've gotten uh, intact cores. So again, you know, you do all of the testing and literally the very first sample and it's different from all of the modeling and testing. Uh, and then another one where you see this Paul sample, well, there is no sample there either. What happened there was we got an intact core, we docked with the rover's body, and it started to crumble, and pieces of it fell into that bit carousel where you're seeing it rotate, and it resulted in it not being able to move. So we ended up throwing that sample away, clearing it out, and then again modified the fact that we wouldn't we, we used to try to ingest the sample because there was some mushrooming that could occur that we wanted to avoid, but we adapted that so we, wouldn't, uh, we would reduce the potential of it crumbling. Uh, so you know, this data has really helped us see, it actually provides information about what the composition of those rocks is physically. Uh, and then we also place instruments. We have an X-ray diffraction uh, instrument and uh, a Raman spectrometer on the surface. But the surface is not very interesting to scientists because it's weathered, it's exposed. So they want to get below it. So we cut a little circle uh, with a uh, drill a bit, uh, about a five centimeter circle. And then we have a little tank of nitrogen gas. We blow away the dust and then position the instruments in it. Here you're seeing again all the abrasions we've done along the x-axis and along the y-axis is uh, the level that we had to achieve of uh, ProAdapt to do it. Mostly it stuck to the model, and then we reached the delta, and even before, just in the very initial you know, uh, mode, it, the rock started cracking. And it was just too soft. The rocks of the delta were too soft. So we had to, this is where humans adjusted the point at which we start the uh, ProDapt algorithm. And why wouldn't we always do that? And partly because you know, we can't replace our bits on Mars. And if they start to uh, dull, we don't want to just do rotary. We want to have some percussive element. And so we don't, unless the rock is soft, we don't just start at a, a very low mode. So we are able to you know, get a number of uh, 
samples. So as a result of this, we now had quite a representative set of samples. So you could see these are all you know, very different varieties of uh, cores that we've collected from different parts of the delta. These were interesting enough that the scientists were getting really excited about it. Now, you know, they're all inside the rover. If the rover was to fail, uh, they're all sort of still inside the rover. And so we don't want that to happen. So one of the strategies, uh, this is the Mars sample return overall mission architecture. So the first leg of it is what Perseverance is doing, where it launched, it's collected a set of samples. What the next phase is in 2028, another mission is going to launch, and this is a joint collaboration with NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency. And on that is going to be a lander. This is quite a massive lander because it's carrying a rocket to Mars so that we can launch these samples back from Mars. And it's also carrying two helicopters based on ingenuity, but those helicopters have wheels and a robotic arm on them. And the reason is that if, say, Perseverance were to die, we don't want all the samples in it. So, so far in the mission, it collected two of each sample. One, it dropped on the ground to save in a cache so that the helicopters could fly and pick it up. The rest, it's continuing to carry, and it's going to carry to the lander and transfer them directly. So that'll be a full cache set, but we have a backup deposited. There's another spacecraft that launches a year before in 2027, which is called, uh, by the European Space Agency, called the Earth Return Orbiter. And that then, once we finish all the tubes, we put them in a canister and launch them into Mars orbit and rendezvous with that. So essentially, we have another robotic system that captures uh, from the Earth Return Orbiter. It essentially captures this canister around Mars orbit, and then we come back to Earth and bring them back to Earth. So this is why, now that we had a rich enough cache of samples, the scientists were ready to be like, let's get them on the ground, because we don't want to lose them. So that's what we recently did. So this pattern here shows, this is the rover, the path of the rover where we were depositing the samples. We put 10 of them on the ground. And why would we do this in this particular pattern? And I think it's a little faint here, but you'll see around each sample location is a, is a disk that shows a helicopter landing pad. For each location, even though for Perseverance, a rover, something the scale of a rover, this is kind of really benign terrain. It's like all completely open. But for helicopters, which, you know, Ingenuity weighs 1.8, these helicopters, including the wheels and arm, are supposed to weigh about 2.3 kilograms. Uh, it, these would be hazards, small, tiny pebbles. So we had to ensure there'd be no pebbles in the region around which we dropped them. So Perseverance had to drop them five meters apart, about five meters. And so these are all the tubes we've dropped and all the locations at which we've dropped them. Uh, and they're now on the surface. So it's essentially, you know, kind of the mission is kind of is, is success in a way because we, we, we have something to bring back. And now here is the locations that we've been so far in the small uh, wedge on the right side. And this is the planned mission. So it's almost like 10 times as much driving as we've done before is in the plan for the future as we crawl our way onto the Delta out and beyond. So we really, there's a lot we can do with this. And as it's here, actually, is uh, this week's uh, sort of image earlier from the, uh, of the week of uh, Ingenuity. So this is Ingenuity's latest flight. So this is the rover taking a picture with its camera off with the high resolution. You're seeing the helicopter. If you can see a little bit of a faint there flying in the sky and uh, continuing on. You can see it's, it's, it's a little dusty now. <laughs> but it's continuing to, um, uh, you know, carry along taking, uh, following the rover. And that's the hope is that it'll be able to keep up and scout ahead. So we continue to have, there are certain locations that we have these branching points I showed you. And so the helicopter would be able to go and pick uh, some of those routes for us. Um, let's see. So one of the interesting things about this is as we get into this part of the mission is what can we do to make things better? Because we want to try and go further and faster. So. Ingenuity has a processor on it. So the rover has to have radiation hardened processes. But because Ingenuity was a technology demonstration, it didn't have as stringent requirements. So it kind of has a commercial Snapdragon 801 processor. So the Ingenuity has more computing than all of the rovers we've sent to Mars combined. <laughs> so essentially, that little helicopter is like massively, uh, you know, has, has a lot of resources. And it's flying Linux, so it's great. But what we have is in addition to the helicopter having a computer, there's also a computer on the base station. So for the 
for Ingenuity to talk to Perseverance, it does it through a base station that is mounted on the rover. That has another processor that I'm showing here. What we'd like to do and what we're working on is using that for rover computing, essentially as a coprocessor to say, I'm gonna ship off computing to this processor that is uh, very capable. Uh, and some of the things we're interested in is what are now some of the bottlenecks for us to actually even break further and drive uh, more. And some of what we are seeing is there are cases where we end drives. Uh, so these are all the faults that we've ever had in drives on Mars. And some of them are the obvious. On the right, you're, uh, this is a graph on SOLS, and on the right, you're seeing slip. So one of, some of them are related to slip because we encountered more slip than we expected. But others are no path, where it didn't find a path through. And currently, we think of this as an expected case. And I'll show you some of the reason why. So this is the same drive I was showing you on Mars, where we're trying to drive a very long distance over three sols. And in the dark blue is the uncertainty growth. So as we are driving, the rover's uncertainty is growing. And by the time it gets to this location, these red obstacles, these red areas are what humans say to keep out of. Uh, it essentially doesn't have a path through, it's, it's completely blocked off because of its uncertainty through that corridor. But if we do global localization, where on board, it takes images of the surrounding terrain, compares it to a global map, then you reduce that uncertainty. Currently, we do this on the ground because it's so computationally expensive, but we could do this on the rover. And so if we had something like this coprocessor, we're looking at doing that. But it's, 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 it's relatively challenging. On the left, you're seeing this image, which is the image taken from the rover's vantage point. And on the right is that orbital map at that, on that same scale. So uh, the resolution between those two is quite different. And so feature matching or even you know, correlation uh, is, is interesting. And then the other challenge is this is a pan through of a 360 nav cam image around the rover. And there are a lot of occlusions and holes in it. So that's the other challenge is either it might be, there may be no features if we are in a featureless terrain or uh, it's, it's rather noisy. But we are, this, is, this is one of the problems that we are, we are working on and are very interested in continuing to solve. Some of the other problems are detecting sand. So we would we currently detect just geometric obstacles, but if we could very accurately detect sand on board, then we don't have to tell it from the ground which regions to keep out of. It could do that on board. Uh, and I think some of the other approaches is on the ground, we're doing this generative path planning. This is also something that we could automatically have the algorithm on board do, which is select the waypoints and generate the path, because then, then you can do that on board with uh, additional information and be able to uh, drive even longer distances. So I think I was just going to show a video of sort of the, Mar actually, I'm going to turn the volume off. But this is a video of the Mars sample return mission, which I just talked about, uh, uh, which shows you know, the Perseverance rover uh, after it's collected the samples finishing collecting and then driving to the location where the Mars sample return lander will, um, will land and driving up to it. So it'll be fairly close because this landing is going to be pinpoint landing. So here, instead of just avoiding an obstacle, it's actually doing visual navigation to a particular point. Uh, transfer the tubes to it. And then uh, this is the canister in which the tubes are sampled. Uh, and then once it is filled up, it closes uh, that canister and then you launches the samples from Mars and uh, rendezvous in Mars orbit uh, to bring those uh, samples back from Earth. And so that, uh, you know, that's going to be a really, you know, the rover is going to potentially be able to watch the rocket launch, which should be, uh, which be really interesting uh, to have. From a distance. Pardon? From a distance. From a distance, <laughs> yes, yes. We don't want to fry the robot. Uh, but actually, it's interesting because of that reason. It actually, the you, if you saw the rocket, it doesn't do a vertical liftoff. It lifts off and then does it, um, does it at an angle, uh, and then um, yeah. So this is kind of the overall mission that we are working towards. And uh, I thought I'd take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much for a great talk. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Who wants to start? Yeah. Oh, she's not on the mic.
But if you can ask the question, that's through the mic so that the people that are watching can hear the question. Uh, so you talked about how um, there's radiation uh, radiation hardened components on the rover itself, and then you put um, commercial components on the helicopter. How did the commercial components survive so well in, uh, within the radiation environment on Mars? Yeah, so we've actually, so, you know, that's one of the things we sort of asked the question about is can the COTS component survive in what we'll see? So we have definitely seen one guaranteed single event of set with the helicopter, and there were a few cases where we didn't get the data back to know if we actually had a radiation issue or not. So that is, uh, but, you know, we've still seen some of them, and that if it were to occur something like that at the type you're doing something like an entry, descent, and landing, that's kind of the end of mission. Uh, so that we're working on approaches to do software-based mitigations now. So looking at approaches where, you know, of course there is the usual voting and doing multiple versions of it, but there's additional approaches we're looking at so we can use these really much more capable computers even, you know, while mitigating that radiation risk. Asks, do you have any fun stories from driving the rover? Right. Oh, yeah. So lots of, uh, so I think one of the drives, which, you know, it's a really short drive, but really it's interesting, was the day we dropped the helicopter. So the helicopter made its way to Mars trapped under the rover. And uh, at some point we had to deploy the helicopter. And essentially that was interesting because it's getting its power from the rover. It, we had to fire these, um, uh, bolts. It was a frangible bolt that is attached, and it, it it's you know one leg at a time would come down and then drop it. But now it doesn't have power from the rover, and if the rover doesn't drive off of it, it can't charge and it won't survive the night. So that drive really had to work, and yet we realized that there was particular uncertainty that that frangible bolt may not have fired, and you don't want a dangling helicopter and driving. So this got very interesting. We actually ended up doing, we ended up writing a patch. We ended up writing a dotto that we sent to the spacecraft right before helicopter deploy that would allow us to check that state and do a direct earth communication to just know if that would happen so that we could abort that drive. Uh, but that was a very interesting drive. Also just the amount of things we thought about. We ended up driving, uh, you know, whether to drive backwards or forwards and things like that. Um, So you mentioned uh, pointing the rover uh, towards Earth. Uh, what about the orbiting relays? And we, and we were supposed to get one in 2022, and we didn't. Uh, what's the status for the orbiting assets? Yeah, that's a you know really good question. So essentially, because we get so much data from Mars, we don't send it direct. We send it through the uh, relays. So we use the high gain antenna, which is pointable for Earth, but we have an omnidirectional UHF antenna with which we talk to the orbiters, so we don't have to worry as much uh, about that. But we have had, you know, we had, we, we currently have Odyssey and we have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, and uh, we are, th this is going to be interesting with the sample return mission, where that Earth return orbiter is also a relay, but it's going to have an interesting, so the orbit that these spacecraft take around Mars impacts the time that we have available. Uh, so that's going to mean that ERO is interesting. It actually is going to communicate so that we get the data down at Earth at about the same time, even though it's going to be a different uh, time on Mars. But we won't have, the current space uh, orbiters are not expected to last as long. So this, this limits what we can do. So once ERO goes, the question becomes, does Perseverance have uh, orbiter to communicate with uh, Earth with. So that's definitely, you know, some of the things is how long the orbiters last. Um, so for the path planning, uh, for like the recommended paths for the rover to take and also for the geographic areas for the rover to avoid, why are all those um, like shapes, like geometric shapes, like circles and rectangles and triangles, why aren't they more like organic to match the geography of the Martian terrain? Yeah, that's good. You know, generally the terrain is organic. So again, simplicity. So essentially for human operators, the tools, it's easier to have something where you just specify. So the flight, it's represented in the onboard flight software. And if you had freeform shapes, 
you would have to have more complex data structures. Whereas if you have a rectangle or a circle, you limit uh, uh, the sort of option space you have to specify with. But this is again interesting, right? Because you're you're not being optimal if you're simplifying it, and there's a trade-off between what's necessary and so, you know what what sort of does the job or not. But that's the reason, primarily, just to keep it simple. Uh, thanks for the great talk, by the way. Um, so how does your team deal with uh, motor failures or like, let's say motors being stuck while it's working or doing the sampling? And has it happened before in the whole journey so far? Yeah, no, that's another good question. So yeah, that tends to be one of the, so you know, we, we actually categorize our faults. There are certain things we call a goal error where there was a logical error or some, you can find a path. And then we have others which we call motion errors which is anything to do with the motor control system or a piece of hardware had a stuck fault. So we, we tend to have both a hard stop on the motors, but we also have a soft stop. So we'd rather hit the software stop before we actually mechanically well. Uh, and so we can detect stalls and that pretty much all our rovers, we've had it happen at some point. And it essentially will be some weird configuration of the rock you encounter or you're trying to go over some terrain, so you might stall. And other areas might just be some race condition or other error, motor control, you know, at that regular rate at which it's operating with freeform terrain. When that happens, we have a lot of ways to detect it, and it stops with a motion error. That's an error we don't tend to clear because there can be so many explanations. You could actually have uh, an actual fault that we didn't understand. So that is one where we currently have Earth in the loop, where the rover will stop and then on Earth, we look at the data and then decide if we want to collect diagnostic data. Often with the motor control fault, we might, it actually auto collects some amount of diagnostic. So it's when it knows it has a fault, it collects higher rate data. If that's sufficient, we might drive the next day. Otherwise, we might collect more data. But yeah, those do occur, depending on you know what kind of terrain you're driving on. I knew there were going to be a lot of questions. Um, so you mentioned a few areas of autonomy that um, kind of make Perseverance stand out as compared to past drivers. I'm curious what the biggest area, like what the biggest gap is between what's currently on Perseverance and what we would need for like a dragonfly in terms of autonomy. Right, right. So, you know, I touched on a few of them. There's other areas that, that I didn't like. We do also autonomous science, like at the end of a drive. We take an image in that we detect what an interesting rock is and we sort of autonomously shoot the laser at it. Um, so there's, you know, various, the science, you need to start doing the science, more, more of the science autonomously too. I think the areas you would need for something like Titan for, for a Dragonfly mission is sort of landing site selection. So when you're going to a location, is it safe? You know, we can, we currently, everything we fly with Ingenuity on from Earth, we detect what the safe landing sites are with the uncertainty you'll have. We are putting, tech, uh, we have on board the software now for its ability to divert from what it thinks is an unsafe landing site. So that would be one. And then another would be just potentially, you know, stringing together those waypoints and picking the next point. I don't think Dragonfly entirely needs to do that. You could end up going to one location, doing the sampling, and then flying off and doing. But those would be some of the areas where uh, you you really want to be able to very robustly detect locations that are safe to land or not. Thank you. Of course, it's a fascinating discussion, and we could keep going for another hour or so, but we had to leave the room for the next class. So thank you again, Andy. Thanks. And uh, that was a great way to end the quarter.